right. Good evening. Hello. Welcome to the 2014 Los Angeles Film Festival, presented by Film Independent. I'm David Hansen, the artistic Woo! director. <laughs> Wonderful to see you here for two phases of January. Before we get started, um, there are some thank yous that are uh, in order to our presenting media sponsor, the Los Angeles Times, who have been long time supporters of the festival, to our host venue, the Regal Cinemas at LA Live. This is the state of the art theater. In fact, in, in praise of them, let me tell you that when Woody Allen was here a couple of years ago for the uh, for our opening night, he said that his screening of, of Duran the Love Theater was technically the best screening of any movie he'd ever shown anywhere. Wow. So coming from Woody, who's shown a few films over the years, high praise for the Regal Cinemas. Um, uh, tonight we are showing you, actually a couple of years ago, um, we showed Drive in this theater, which uh, was written by the director of tonight's film, uh, Mr. Jose Manini, who is making an extraordinarily assured uh, cinematic debut based on a wonderful Patricia Highsmith novel. You are in for a great treat. Um, be sure to vote afterwards, but let me introduce to you Mr. Hossein Amini. actually write the screenplay? No, I didn't, because didn't. We did, I couldn't, I wrote the screenplay in 2008, the first draft, uh -huh. um, but I'd been thinking about it such a long time, so I, I kind of remembered it differently from when I first wrote it. So I, I sort of remembered Chester being this handsome Fitzgerald hero in a white suit, and then I went and reread the book, and he was overweight and sweaty and already kind of a drunk from the beginning. So, things, uh -huh. so it became this combination of, I guess, the book and my memories of the book. Uh -huh. And uh, then did you, once, once you cast the film, talk a little bit about how you ended up with this extraordinary cast and how that changed your... Well, the, the cast was, was, apart from Oscar, I didn't even know Vigo or Kirsten were reading it. It's one of those things that I guess happens, it's a great thing about being represented by an agency in LA, is, is that I write a script and it sort of, it sort of got into the hands of, of Vigo and I just suddenly got this fantastic phone call out of the blue saying Vigo Mortensen's interested in playing Jester. So that's, that's really how the whole uh -huh. thing got real. Mm -hmm. The project became real yeah. once he got interested. Did you do any tailoring of the script to these specific actors? Yes, I did, because I, I had a fantastic experience um, working with Nick Reffin on Drive where he sort of included me in the, um, 
It's the first time as a screenwriter I've been allowed to sit with actors. Um, mm -hmm. And they tear into the script, but it got better because of their input. And, and I did the same thing with the actors on this. I sort of just spent about a whole year before we started shooting just talking to them. And go visit Oscar in New York or Vigo in Madrid. Uh -huh. and, and really let them help me kind of shape the script as well. So it sort of felt very collaborative from a much earlier. And then I rehearsed a month before shooting, so I had time to go away and rewrite based on those rehearsals. Uh -huh. And what was it like for you making that leap from being a screenwriter uh, to being a director? Did it, did it change the way you thought about being a screenwriter? I, I, I sort of. Um, I didn't realize how it, well, I didn't realize how important momentum is. I think that's the, that's the thing I discovered in the editing room, especially with Highsmith, where it's it's almost like they're half thrillers, half dramas. Mm -hmm. and, and what I found out very quickly was that I think an audience can start off with a drama, then go into a thriller, but they don't then want to go back to being a drama. Uh -huh. and, and things like rhythms like that, I found. And, and, and I I was doing a Le Carre adaptation, which I sort of right. didn't do while I was filming this. I went back to it and I cut 20 pages out of the script. Wow. Right. Which which Le Carre? It's, it's a book called Our Kind of Traitor, which ah. is um, which I think I just finished filming, but um, that was one of the ones where I haven't been included as a screenwriter. Yeah. <laughs> Should we take some questions from the from the audience? Um, right here. Uh, fantastic film, really enjoyed it. I felt a, a very strong Hitchcock vibe when watching it. What were some films that influenced you and your directing style? What were some films that influenced you? Uh, well, I, there was, there was, I mean, Hitchcock had, it's funny, the, the truth of Hitchcock book probably influenced me more than any specific Hitchcock movie on this one, because it was, it was more, it's, it's the first book I read that made me sort of think about each camera move or shot is, is telling story. It was that, it's, I guess it's that classical approach of, of, of like thinking about every shot and, and what it's doing and stuff like that. But I watched a lot of 60s European cinema. I was sort of, I had so long before the film got made, it took such a long time to get it done, I, and I watched movies the whole time anyway. But um, I watched lots of French New Wave movies, lots of Italian cinema. I mean, not even related to this, but I, I kind of, you know, I started rewatching Antonioni movies and just, just thought, oh my God, this guy's the master at, at blocking actors and stuff. So even though there's nothing specific, and also just the way he showed the breakdown of marriages, you know, the Fellini movies I'd watch, and just, it, 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 was, it was sort of like, it was a great film school, really, just spending, you know, however long I had before the film got done, just watching lots of movies from that period. Plan Soleil was probably the biggest influence, which is the, uh, French, it's the French version of Tanzan Mr. Ripley. Yeah. I saw that the film was, I think, dedicated or a special thanks to Anthony Mangella, the late Anthony Mangella and the late Sidney Pollack. What were their influence? What was their part of the film at one time? Well, they were going to produce it before they very tragically passed away. And, and, and it, it, that was the first time, I think, that the, the movie became real was when the two of them and, and our, our other producer, Tom Sternberg, sort of you know, said, we, we'll accept you as a director. So that, that was the first, you know, and then the second, second thing was, you know, after they passed away, sort of nothing happened for a while. Um, but, but Anthony's influence, I think, he was incredibly generous um, as a producer. He wasn't just a great director, I think. He, he took such an interest in, in other writers and directors and things like that. And the moment someone like him says, you know, I wanted to take a chance on you, it, it suddenly other people take you seriously. So I felt this incredible debt of gratitude. And, and, and Max Anthony's son is an executive producer on the movie, which I think is, is incredibly well deserved. Uh, yes, right, right here. Uh, the same the, the, the settings of the, the only thing that's quite different is uh, in the book, the ending is in Paris, and I felt I felt there's something really important about them getting further and further away from America, and and I thought somehow going back to Paris was bringing them closer to home, and, and particularly for Chester's character, I wanted him to feel. You know, someone who's so in control and is a con man and is controlling everything is suddenly in his, his, his zone of least comfort. And I sort of like the idea of, you know, whether it was the, the sounds of the streets in Istanbul or the mosques and stuff, that almost the noise is haunting him for what he's done. So, so I sort of took it, I, I felt it should go further and further east. Is there any pressure to not do it, period? Um. I didn't, I didn't think with these movies, because I think the plot's already kind of, it, it all depends on false passports and mm -hmm. this and that. And I just think, I think with modern, you know, police forensic technology, right, I don't right. think it would last very long, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, I didn't think about it, but I very yeah. quickly sort yeah. of realised that. Yeah. I just think the high sense of plotting is, is just something of its period. And I think her characterization is what's mo most modern about her. Yeah. That's, that's what. Yeah. The whole Oedipal thing is obviously something that attracted you. That's the father's son. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it's. But also, just, I think there's something about the way she captures the dynamics between men that you can admire another man, but also just want to be better than them. And I think the ugliest <laughs> side of male mm -hmm. kind of competition. Right, right. Um, and I think she's, she's, she's in all her books seem to do that. Yeah. She sort of gets from the truth in order for the men to sort of come and mm -hmm. go mano a mano. Uh, yes, over here. Um, you've adapted Sally from Highsmith and now Lepore. And I'm wondering what it is about the genre, <laughs> the broader genre, that excites you. About crime thrillers. Yeah. yeah. The, qu the question is about uh, being attracted to adapting the Carré, Salas, which was Drive, and uh, Highsmith. What attracts you about that genre? Well, I think it's 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 the intensity that crime dramas can take you into, and I, I find the most interesting when they're about character. I'm, I'm sort of less interested in, I guess, the, the plotting or the the, 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 the way that it, you know. I think Highsmith's. Um, Hero was Dostoevsky, and, and that's another one where you sort of think, well, I remember reading Prime and Punishment thinking it's extraordinary because it's, it's, I'm turning pages and I want to know what happens, but I'm getting this incredibly deep insight into, into just, you know, human beings. And, 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 and I, think, I think with all those writers, those three writers, there's something about the way they use crime stories to explore um, whether it's relationships between people or, and it's not just about darkness, because I think, I think all kinds of drama can, but it's, I guess it's putting people under pressure, they're always under pressure and seeing how people react and those things, and I, I just find that interesting. Yes, we're up there. It was, and I think it's 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 about the um, it's really Chester needs a new identity. I think that's a more important thing. He's he's on the run, and they they. I mean, in the book, actually, I, I sort of try to give it more logic than it has in the book. In the book, they, I think they just leave it behind um, because I, I guess you, you know, and, and and I sort of felt that in a way because he's being chased by people who know who he is anyway. Um, that he, he needs to suddenly just get away, and, and those passports aren't useful to him because I think, in a way, they're more of a way of tracking him down and getting new passports. That was, but it was a very tricky section of the, the and it was it was from the book, and it was it was sort of wrestling with the plot logic it was was quite tough. Yes, we have. Thank you. I, I found editing really hard, and I think I made the mistake of jumping in too early, um, and um, instead of letting my editor kind of be, you know, giving him that space, and, and I, I very quickly went snow blind, and 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 it was interesting because I found that every all my fears and paranoia and insecurity about how the film would turn out was suddenly affecting my viewing experience, and and. And, and, and it was very hard for me for a while to see what was working and what wasn't, and if it was too fast or too slow. And, and I think that was absolutely first time in experience of just sort of wanting to get in there and be involved in every aspect. And oddly, I kind of I, I trusted my collaborator, collaborator so much more in the shooting process that I think I should have been slightly less kind of uh, you know um, intrusive in the editing, maybe. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry to see you. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. One of my favorite things was um, when you were talking about the story and the way you were able to make the
Yeah, well, it was, that was one of those things I want to talk about remembering the book differently. Is, is um, I, I think I must have read some Fitzgerald in between my first and second readings because I suddenly remembered him like Gatsby or Dick Diver, and I didn't. Um, and I sort of felt in the book he's already he doesn't he starts off being in a place of relative disintegration. But I sort of I sort of love this idea of him being golden, this couple being almost like a Fitzgerald couple that you see, mm. you know, Chester for the first time as like a, a god at the Parthenon, at the end of it he's he's a guy he's in the gutter. I, I think that, that sort of journey was, was really interesting to me. And it's sort of there are elements of it in the book, but I, I, I sort of it's it's not it doesn't st he doesn't start off being like I think in the book he goes to the second or third most expensive hotel in town because he can't afford the best and I sort of had him going to the best and, and wearing the smartest suit and sort of so that, that, that was conscious and Vigo was very what was interesting about Vigo working with him on this was, was I sort of wanted I was so thrilled that he wanted to do the movie because of the way he looks I just thought he looks like and his screen persona is so heroic but he, he's also an actor who really embraces the ugly side he, he loves doing that stuff so being paranoid and jealous and, and being a loser really is, is something that I'm not sure how many actors would want to do. But he was, th those were some of his favorite scenes, I think. Can we talk a little about how you collaborated with the composer? You used a, a motive arts composer, Iglesias, who's wonderful. Yeah, you see someone there. How did you choose him? I, I sort of just loved um, the music he done by my but also the stuff he done on the Constant Garden and Tinker Taylor. Mm -hmm. But I, I found the music a struggle too, and it was interesting because I remember at one stage when we were showing the film to sort of audiences, and there was like we were having a real struggle with people having any sort of empathy with Chester. And I remember saying, "Child, there, so like even if everyone else hates Chester, the music should be in love with him." And and we started to sort of, and, and most of the love themes in in, in the score, are, uh, Alberto wrote for Chester. So so it was sort of it was the one one of the ways we found of trying to sort of make him. You know, I, I was, I, I, I mean, I, I was in love with the character right from the beginning, but I sort of, I, I think I needed to make an effort to get everyone else to, to like him. Yeah. Uh, yes, some more questions. Up here? Yeah. Um, I was curious because the locations were so amazing. Did you film at the real Palatine? Yeah, we did, and we had to, but we had to use some, um, um, some visual effects to get rid of the, the scaffolding because it's. It's covered in scaffolding, and they've also done this thing where they're, they're trying to show the bits they've restored by having it in different coloured. Oh. So, so it looks like this weird stripey thing right now. Um, and and we, I sort of wanted to, it to look like pictures I'd seen of the 60s, the Puffin in the 60s. I thought you did um, uh, the writer, the original writer, really the best that I've ever seen. And, and your, your decisions were very wise. Thank you. She, she's such. She's such. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with her as a writer. I think she's. Uh, I don't, you know, with, with, when you, without amazing characters at the heart of something, it's really hard to. You know, I think when someone gives you, as someone who's adapting, really great characters, you can invent stuff and change stuff. But, but that base has to be there, and I just think she's. You, know, you, did, it, you did it justice. Thank you. Yeah. No, that, that's the most I could hope for. Actually. Further questions? The screen, yes, oh, up there. Yes, good evening. I really enjoyed the film. Thank you very much. What's with the title? Where, what does it mean? Well, I, I, <laughs> no, I think, I think this, I mean, I, I, what I find about the title is that there's, it's, it's the god, uh, Janus, is the two headed god. And the two, uh, the back of the heads are stuck together almost like Siamese twins, and the, these two faces are facing outwards. And for me, that was partly the idea of these two men who, even though they hate each other, are somehow tied and twinned. And they keep on running off in different places, but end up in the same place. And, and, and almost, there's a line I think where Chester says, you know, you're the only person left in the world I can talk to. And I thought that was the idea that they are, they can't escape each other somehow. And, and also Jack, um, January being the month where the, you know, the old gives way to the new. And the idea in Greek mythology that the son has to kill the father in order to become a man. And, and, and I sort of felt there was, I don't think she ever explained, I mean, I didn't find anything which, where she explained it, what she meant, but those were certainly the meanings I took from it. Over here in the middle. Okay. Um, thank you for your
I, I write every day. I mean, even weekends, and I need to do at least four or five. But I don't write beyond like one or two o'clock because I found when I start anything I wrote after that, I'd write one line and then rewrite it a hundred thousand times, and then then realise it was no better than it was at the beginning. So I sort of learned that at two o'clock I should just stop. Um, what time I, do you start? I start. I probably start about seven, seven thirty. Um, and, and sort of I do it every day because I sort of find I lose the momentum otherwise. Um, and I sort of, I guess it's method writing where I sort of need to be in that zone. And I find it very hard to work on more than one thing at a time. But I think in terms of the adaptation process, what I sort of, because I, I mainly do adaptations, I think it's it's a relationship that I had as a read, you know, I have as a reader with a book and I kind of tend to read it lying down on a sofa or something and I sort of suddenly have that moment where it's, you feel like you've seen, felt something that nobody else has felt. And it's a very intimate relationship between a reader and a, a book. And also, even the bits that I skipped over because I found them boring, I sort of, is trying to f capture the experience of, the, of reading the book as well as the book, I think, is, is, is sort of how I approach it. Yeah, right here. Hi. Uh, as somebody who does adaptations, when you're reading a new book, are you constantly picturing, like, like if you're enjoying it, like how would I shoot this and starting to take notes before you finish the book or do you go straight through it as a reader? Well, the terrible thing is if, 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 if I know a book's already been optioned or is being made into a film, I don't read it, so it's very hard to read the pleasure because it's now, it's now, it's now you know, just because I think, oh my God, I wish I'd done that one, I'd get so annoyed if I read it and loved it. And so, which is, which is terrible because I should, but I tend to read more factual stuff than fiction now because of that. The budget was, I'd say, around, I think, about 18, 17, 18 million dollars, and it was, we got it through, um, I guess through, really, to be honest, I think Vigo. I think, I think there was, the, I think the moment, you know, and I, th I think it's, you know, very mundane, you know, that his value in Europe is such that, you know, suddenly that budget becomes possible. Um, but I, I sort of, I didn't realize how much of, you know, the thing about shooting in different places it actually takes up so much money and, and that was you know so so it was you know it's a very ge it's an incredibly generous budget for a first movie so i can't complain <laughs> how long was your shooting uh, i'd say it's about uh, eight nine weeks but we didn't have any we didn't have we had one day off we did six <laughs> day weeks and stuff And I came in under budget because I hadn't been told exactly how much money. Well, not, not deliberately. I thought that was really bad. I was, I was really, I was incredibly ashamed of myself. But it was partly because I wasn't told how much money. I think there's a fear of first-time directors that you're going to go over budget and mess up and whatever. So I think they've kept so much back. Um, <laughs> Well, the, the crew was amazing, but the traffic was horrendous. I mean, it was we quite often we sort of because I used to go with my um, with the director of photography and the first AD, and and we'd get maybe a hundred yards and walk. So we'd walk forty minutes to get on set because the traffic was so bad, and because because of the budget we were staying quite far out, and, and, and so it was. Um, uh, but, but I have to say, the, crew, the crews were amazing, and I think they've done so many movies now, in big budget, much bigger budget movies. The, 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 the level of expertise was amazing. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about the use of race and when you now on purpose No, it was definitely, I mean, it was, it was connected to the landscapes as well. I sort of wanted the landscapes and the weather and everything to sort of almost reflect the, 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 the sort of disintegration of the characters. Um, so the idea that they start off in this cliche picture postcard Athens and then they get to creep and the, almost the elements are punishing them. So there's dust and there's, there's heat and whatever. And then it's time blowing them up. It's just that film noir kind of buffing the leg. But, but, but the, 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 I, think, I think the idea of almost the weather, and it's going to sound incredibly pretentious, but, but the idea of the weather punishing them or, or the elements punishing them felt... I sort of had this idea that, 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 that there's the Greek gods, they've done something wrong, and, and hmm. that, that whether it's fate or the Greek gods or something is, is constantly tearing apart these illusions that they've created for themselves and, and, and 
there's, there's a cruelty in Ice Smith's writing, which I think is the, the landscape and the weather reflect it pretty good bit. Yes, just shout out. <laughs> I have a question. What yeah. Well, actually, the, the scene I sort of read, there's a scene in the ferry where it's a silent scene between Oscar and Vigo where they're just staring at each other after Colette's died. Um, and there's, that was a three page dialogue scene when I first wrote it. Um, and that's one of the great things about rehearsing with actors because I just very quickly realized that they didn't need to say that. And they're, they're smart enough actors to go, I don't need to say that. So, so it turned from a three page dialogue scene to a silent scene. And also, that day, Oscar just turned up and he, he was in a corner of the in the sort of Barry Museum. And he was in a corner and he was keeping to himself. And, and I'd always assumed before I directed that as a director, you go over and you talk and you talk and you tell them what you want and this and that. And I realized very quickly that sometimes you just have to leave them alone. And I just have had that moment where I thought, and, and then I just let him do it. He just came and he did it and he surprised me and he surprised Vigo. And I think that gave uh, that, an energy to the scene. And I, that, that was the biggest lesson I learned about directing, is how to say as much as possible in as little as possible so you don't start interfering with, A, how good the actors are, but also their thought processes. Because I think the moment they start overthinking, some of that spontaneity goes. Yes, very good. Okay. It was a combination, but what was interesting about the, the, the first cut you talked about was, in my head, Colette and my dad never slept together, but both Oscar and Kirsten were convinced that they did. And it was one of these, we, we, had, we had arguments, we've had arguments in, in Q&As where they sort of, they go, do they sleep together? And I'm going, no, and they're going, absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sticking to my room, I know. <laughs> yes, Well, the, the octopus was the only one I'd really consciously written into the script um, because I, I remember being on holiday in Greece when I was a kid and seeing someone do that. And I, I remember just being shocked by the noise and just, just the whole, the constant kind of brutality of that. But the other stuff, the vultures, we just got really lucky because they, they we were just filming in those mountains and, you know, suddenly they just flew past and, and everyone's scrambling madly to get sort of the camera in position to shoot them. And, and cats were just, it sort of became a theme, and um, the, the producer and the editor, two of them were obsessed with cats. So, <laughs> so, so I was at one stage kind of going too many cats, and they were, they were sort of, you know, so. Uh, but the, the, the octopus one was the only one that I think was very consciously sort of symbolic when I was writing the script, anyway. Any It's can I look at your glasses? I think it's as simple as that, yeah. The question was what was the little girl on the bus saying? Yes. I know that times when you have to edit a film, uh, was there any scenes that you wish could have been longer or cut? And, in, in, and if so, could you mention which one? Yeah, there's, there's a scene actually that my, there's a scene I, I had to, I, I didn't have to cut, but I ended up cutting it because it was, there was a scene where, um, after they're eating the shellfish, he gets very violently ill, and then um, Colette goes and is very, very tender and looks after him, and, and, and the very next scene she goes and semi-seduces Oscar. And when we screen it for audiences, it was really interesting because that's what I love about Highsmith, is, is that her characters don't go from A to B to C, they don't follow traditional character development, which we have in so many movies and scripts, I think, now. 
But Bill said something, it, sometimes it doesn't work for an audience, and I kept showing it to people. And no one was putting pressure on me to change it or cut it. But, but it was a combination of trying to, it was a slow paced area of the movie, so I sort of I felt it had to move faster. But also, so many members of, of, of who I was showing it to, or people I was showing it to, were saying they found that lurch from her being tender to her husband to unfaithful in the very next scene very tough, or, or didn't work for them and felt illogical. And it was a scene that I loved, and um, I kind of still, you know, it's, it's, it's going to probably haunt me for a while. Yeah, no, no, and also the performances were so brilliant in it that, that it, it, it's tough when an actor knows they've done a great scene and you go, well, you know, that awful <laughs> conversation when you go, well, you know, that scene you really loved, I had to cut it. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> One more question here. Yeah. I, thought the, I thought the cinematography was like just absolutely gorgeous. What was your relationship like with the cinematographer and how did you... He, he was fantastic. Marcel Ziskin, he's, he'd done Mike Winterbottom's movies. Um, he's very young. I think he did his first sort of deep shots at DP when he was like 21 or 22. He was 33 when we were working together. And, and when I kind of spoke to him on the phone before I sort of asked him to do it, um, I said to him, look, I'm a first time director. If I, if I do, if I ask for something really stupid, just tell me. And he goes, well, I can't tell you unless I've tried it. And then I just thought that was a very collaborative, encouraging kind of answer. And, we, we watched a lot of, um, I mean, he's, we're both huge Chinatown fans, so just in terms of very simple, classic, you know, just, and I think with Polanski stuff, and I'm not comparing, not beginning to, but it's sort of, it, it's more, again, in a slightly engineered, the, the directors I admire, I think they do what they do, how sophisticated the camera moves are, or something's a single take, but it's not a showy single take, as in, you know, going from the to C or whatever, they're doing, you know, a lot of character work in very simple stuff, and, and we talked about, I had a lot of, I had a whole, again, because I had so long before I made the film, I had a huge visual library of photographs from the period and stuff. So we, we went through those and, and talked about how best to capture that effect. But it was a really close collaboration, and, and I think particularly as a first time director, a really important one. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for coming. Don't forget to vote.